Okay. A um, couple of things. As soon as I can close that screen out here. Hold on a second. Alrighty. All right. Trying to get some movements going on. We have a few new members. Peter and who else? Let's see. Are you here? Yeah, the Liz So the welcome to Astra. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think that everybody else is uh, veterans. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna run through some things real quick before we get to the uh, to the main event. And I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Um, coming up tomorrow, actually, is uh, NEF, the virtual experience. So if you don't have the um, the link for the um, the free event that's going to start at 10 a.m. and run until 8 o'clock uh, tomorrow night, um, go up on the web page and uh, just click on the NEFexpo.com. And uh, if you have time... <laughs> And, um, you know, check it out. This will be the second one because of COVID um, that they're doing uh, in this format right now. All right. And we got about 17 hours before that actually happens. I think last year, didn't they do it later in the year? They did. They, they did push it out a little bit later. But this year, you know, they, they put it pretty much back to their same, uh, their same time. Okay. Uh, a couple of things that we did put in our publication, it's uh, Global Astronomy Month. So if you want to, you know, check out the events that are going on, uh, they do have a full calendar of things that are going on for the uh, month of April. So I think it's uh, something well worth checking out. And also is uh, International Dark Sky Week. You still have a couple of days to, uh, you know, to check out what they have. Uh, I've already uh, gone through here, and it's actually going to help me for an upcoming project I have um, that uh, we'll we'll talk about in a in a few minutes. There is I don't know if everybody gets the NSN news. Uh, recently, I've been talking to Lucy's mom about doing the. The Girl Scout astronomy badges, and it just worked out that they're now having through the Night Sky Network a uh, workshop that's going to go through a couple of Wednesdays to actually work and to uh, to learn how to work uh, with the uh, the new badges that the Girl Scouts have. So I spoke to Liz's mom and uh, Lucy's mom, and I will be attending those uh, workshops to better prepare myself you know, for working with the girls. Uh, if anybody else is interested in, in uh, looking at this, you know, just let me know and I'll, I'll send a link out to you if you don't have it already. What were the times for that, Jim? I'm trying to... It's, it's going to be uh, three Wednesdays, <laughs> April 25th, and then um, uh, in May... It's going to be. Uh, yeah, the time is no good for me. Yeah, yeah, the calendar is a little bit misleading, but it's April 28th, May 5th, and May 12th at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I don't know how long it runs, but um, you know, those are the three dates. You have up until the 11th of uh, committing to this if, uh, if you are interested in, uh, in working in it. So if you all let me know and, uh, you know, we'll see what we can do. Okay. Um, something that came across to me on Facebook uh, is a, it goes on every weekend during the summer, I believe partway in the fall, where you can go to a location in upstate New York and um, you can actually, you know, camp under the stars. And there is a guy there that actually, you know, guides you, guides you through the night sky. 
for about two hours with her with, with his laser pointer. And then afterwards, you know, the rest of the night is yours. You know, you camp out in a, in a tent, you know, next to your car. Me and Gloria have been talking about doing this because I'd be interested in bringing my camera up there to start, you know, taking some, you know, alternate Milky Way, you know, location shots. Uh, I found this the other day. Of course, I haven't talked to Sam and his mom yet about this. So this is the first time I'm springing it on them. So more, more to come on this, you know, for me and, uh, and Sam, if he's interested. And if anybody else wants more of this information, let me know and I'll send it out to you. All right. And uh, last item is, it looks like the uh, Mars helicopter. Um, uh, Ro lost her internet. The Mars helicopter is supposed to go off uh, April 11th at 10.54 p.m. So, uh, you know, if anybody's interested in catching that, you know, time has now been posted and hopefully, you know, they'll keep to that time schedule. Uh, let's see here. We'll give Ro another minute um, to, to come back. Does anybody have any questions on anything? Uh, that I've uh, said here. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll keep an eye on for Ro coming back. Um, we have a guest speaker tonight. His uh, name is uh, Kevin Lloyd. I've known Kevin for uh, you know quite a number of years. And uh, he'll be doing a presentation tonight on uh, radio astronomy. So, you know, for the presentation, um, what I'll ask you to do is to disable your, um, your video feed so we can, you know, have less problems with the bandwidth. And then when the presentation is over, we can all, you know, come back with the videos again and show our faces. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Kevin. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi. Nice to meet you. Make, make your acquaintance. Um, what I want to talk about today is uh, radio telescopes, more, more so than radio astronomy. Um, and uh, okay. yes. I've, Sorry. I just got a call from the operator. Yeah. And he said you're doing a Zoom meeting. Yes. He said you can't because of the internet and then all that that thing that they're using to observe. Yeah. And he said that nobody can't be doing it. Oh. Road. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> all right. Um. So so radio telescopes. Uh. What you're looking at here is a is an antenna array in in Australia. Um, my my presentation is not going to get anywhere near this level of sophistication. In fact, um, what I'm going to talk, be talking about is very very basic 101. Um, yeah, this is the this is the right uh, class for you if you've never seen nor heard of a radio telescope. Um, my name is Kevin Lloyd, uh, and I've been working with uh, radio telescopes for the last 10 years. Um, and I, I have no special training with radio telescopes and no advanced degrees. Uh, so, so really, the point of my um, presentation here is, is to help everybody understand that, look, if I can do this, you can do this. And, and if, if you look to the left here, uh, you guys, I'm pretty sure you recognize this. Uh, right, Galaxy Center, um, and I have this for a reason. The, the guy that discovered that Galaxy Center emitted radio waves, he, he literally did it with uh, a dipole antenna and a shortwave radio. Okay, that's how simple this is. Uh, you, you don't need a lot of heavy equipment and heavy knowledge and, and um, things like that to get started and, and actually learn things and, and maybe even discover something. Um, but in order to get going, you will need some, some key concepts and some, some basic uh, understanding. 
So uh, with that, I will step into the, the presentation. So uh, basic concepts. Um, hey, Kevin. Yes, sir. I'm not sure if you're sharing anything. I don't know if anybody else can see any oh, slides. Crud. I'm not sharing. Dang on it. Uh, stand by. Thank you. Uh, where's my share button? There we go. Okay. Now, how does it look? Uh, looks like it started now. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Ah, okay, good, good. So, uh, thanks again. Um, so, so here's that radio telescope array, right? And it's very, uh, very sophisticated stuff. And like I said, we're not going to be getting anywhere near that. Um, uh, here's, here's the slide I was just talking about. Um, and here's the galaxy center. Um, I mean, really to get going with this stuff, you don't need a whole lot. Uh, and, and that really is, is what I hope you take away from all this. Um, but you will need some key concepts and, and that's what I want to talk about right now. So, um, your basic concepts, um, all radio telescopes have three basic components. Um, a receiver, all right? And that was obvious. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody got that before I even said it. Um, the next one, an antenna, all right? Maybe that wasn't obvious, but it was intuitive. And I'm pretty sure you would have figured it out without much help. Uh, the third one is a recording device. And that's the one where I would expect everybody to be a little confused. Um, but these three components, and you're in business. You've got a radio telescope. Uh, the receiver doesn't have to be fancy. The antenna doesn't have to be fancy. The recorder doesn't have to be fancy. Um, but um, that that's all it is. Uh, I don't expect any questions at this point. Uh, so I'm just gonna move on. Um, so how does it work? All right, that, that, that's got to be a, a big question, right? Because you can hook up a radio and, and, and an antenna and a recorder, but what am I listening for? What is, what is the objective here? So think of a radio as an instrument that it basically just takes frequencies beyond your ability to hear and brings them down to the audible frequency range. Um, and normally, uh, in, in the carrier frequency that you're tuned to, there's intelligence, there's music, there's a talk show, there's something uh, in, in the broadcast realm. But what we're going to be doing is, is we're going to be pointing our telescopes to a natural radio source. So there will be no broadcast, uh, unfortunately. Uh, if there were, then people like SETI would, would um, be famous. <laughs> uh, but... The, the basic concept of this kind of radio is you're going to tune to a, a radio frequency and you're going to listen for an increase or a decrease in the amplitude of the audible signal, which will in this case be noise because you won't have uh, any anything other than the carrier. Um, and this is what you're going to look for. Uh, this is a graph from, from one of my um, uh, radio telescopes. Uh, and what you're seeing here in the red that's the, the a noise level. It's basically white noise, hissing sound. And then you can see that for three minutes, there was a, a, a large spike in the amplitude of that frequency. Um, and that correlated to an x-ray burst from the sun. Um, and it's really just as simple as that. Uh, do we have any questions at this point? Because what I'd like to do now is um, let you listen to an actual radio. Uh, S is called the S wave. It's from Jupiter. Excuse me, Kevin. Everyone, yeah. if you want to ask a question, either use the little icon to raise your hand or unmute yourselves and ask the question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have, I'm not watching my... Um, my screen. If you're if you're wave, waving your hand, trying to get my attention, I, I'm not looking at you. Yeah, well, me and Roll keep an eye on it. Uh, yeah. Kevin. Okay. Okay. And and I'm I'm just that kind of person anyway. Just jump in. <laughs> I'm not somebody that's uh, formal. Uh, uh, but anyway, so so this right here is 
is uh can you hear that by the way no you, oh man i should have well anyway when you get the slide deck you'll be able to listen to it and what it is is it's a sound of hissing noise uh and uh, it, it's and it's varying in its amplitude. It's going the noise level is going up and down, up and down. Try playing it again. Real, we'll, we'll all be quiet. Uh, okay. Oh, sorry. Me. I wonder. I wonder if I have to amp, turn this up or something. I don't know. Can you hear that? No. No. Sometimes what I do is I use like a little external speaker to mm. boost it a little bit. Yeah, well, sorry. Uh, I was That's hoping right. that, I was hoping this would work because <laughs> uh, it, it's kind of interesting. Um, mostly though, you're gonna be looking at the, at the graph when, when you're you know, working a radio telescope, but this is still interesting. Um, this one right here sounds a lot like uh, popcorn popping. I mean, it's just crackling and snapping and popping. Um, and that's a radio storm from Jupiter at uh, 24 megahertz. Um, darn it, I was hoping that would work. Anyway, so uh, any questions? I have point? a question. Yes, uh, sir. You're only at 24 megahertz? Okay, so those recordings were recordings so, at that because so, i'm i'm a radio amateur so would i be able to use a hf receiver with just a antenna and listen to it sure could absolutely interesting okay I, in fact um when i was first experimenting with this uh that's what i did i, I had a shortwave radio and i was tuned to 20 uh, megahertz because you know i uh, i forget how i knew but i, I knew there was going to be a radio storm from jupiter and I was listening to the snapping and the cracking and the popping and, and, and I called my kids over and I said, kids, kids, listen, you know, and they were 12, 14, <laughs> listen to this. This is an actual radio storm, you know, going, coming from Jupiter and, oh yeah, that's great. Dad, this sounds like a bunch of popping and snapping. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. but, uh, but I thought it was real cool myself. I was jazzed. So, yeah. Um, and there are there are uh, there's software out there that'll help you, um, uh, uh, you know, tune in at the right time. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, anybody else? Do you live in the area or are you out of state? I am in Colorado. Oh, OK. Yeah, because so. a few years ago we had visited. Um, there's a radio astronomy spot that's um, north of us. And they had the big dish and everything. It used to be, I think, Bell Labs or something like that. And it was just an amateur club that took it over. And they had interest in us setting up their telescope to point at certain things while these noises were going on. It was like, but then they never got back to us. So. <laughs> oh, well, you know, and, and this... Uh, uh, what was just pointed out is is actually really important because if you just tune to 20 megahertz with your shortwave radio, uh, you don't need a fancy antenna. You can listen to Jupiter. You can listen to the uh, uh, radio noise from Jupiter. I know it's that Carlton, simple. Carlton, I think, is another ham radio operator. I think a few of the guys are. Yep, yep. And th th those are the guys who will be able to jump right in and take right off uh, mm -hmm. everybody else will probably have to think about it a little bit more um but still what okay, got so, you interested in it uh what what got me interested in it yeah well okay uh when i was in middle school i was very much a optical uh, uh enthusiast right i was every night i was out with my telescope and i was looking at every single planet i could find every messier object everything um and then i found this book in in my uh, uh, junior high school library, and it said, you know, how to make a radio telescope. And I said, whoa, this is interesting. I, you know, and and this is 1972 or 78, excuse me. And uh, so I'm I'm thumbing through it, and it said I could use my FM receiver. 
And I said, my FM receiver, and that's all I need? Wait a minute, I got to read more. So I read more, and it, it said something about a recorder, and that was a, a mechanical recorder, and that, you know, very complicated. But that stuck with me over the years. Um, I, I put the book down on a cart because I was late for class, and guess what? When I came back to check it out the next day, couldn't be found. So I never got a chance to read the book. <laughs> um, but when I got a little older and, and you know, I, I, it, the thoughts occurred to me again and I said, this can't be that hard. I mean, if I can use an FM receiver, it can't be that hard. So I just started exploring and I've, I figured out a lot of this stuff. So. Hmm. Hey, but, Kevin. Yes, sir. I, uh, just real quick, there there may be a checkbox in your share control. It says share computer sound. If you check uh, that, we might be able to hear that recording that you tried to play. Share computer sound. Share sound. Oh, oh, good job. Thank you, Vinny. You the man. All right. Let me let me see if I can start here. All right, what do we got? Can you hear that? And now we can hear it. Ah, oh, thank you. Okay, and so that what you would be seeing on this graph, of course, is just waves as you know it was increasing in amplitude and decreasing in amplitude. This is the one that I've actually heard uh, with my shortwave radio. Pretty interesting, right? It's a lightning storm from Jupiter. Now, how how did you know that was going to happen at the right? How did you know to be there at the right time? I, I can't, I just can't remember. That was several years. That was at the very beginning of when I was starting. Um, so yeah, I just can't remember how I knew that. But um, there are, I'm sure you can search it on, on the internet. I'm sure there's a way to get the prediction. Oh, any, anything else? Yeah, I, I would keep moving forward, uh, Kevin. Okay. We can pep you with questions maybe a little bit later. Okay. Well, so let's talk about a receiver. Um, here, what I have in this chart here is your basic hardware, right? You have AM, FM, uh, shortwave, uh, television. You can actually use the audio from television, uh, channel three or four. Um, and, you know, it covers a wide range of uh, bands, uh, MF, uh, VHF, HF, uh, et cetera. Um, but the one that I want to talk about the most for you guys, because I think it'll be the quickest and easiest way for you to get going, is this SDR um, uh, dongle setup. All right. But, but like we've already talked about, you can use a shortwave radio and it'll work. Um, the key, the, there is one caveat, the receiver must have the ability to disable ACG, automatic gain control. Um, because as you heard uh, the recording, right, the, the amplitude's going up and down, you don't, want the, you don't want the hardware trying to smooth that out for you. You want to be able to capture the, the increase in the, in the sound, in the level of the sound. Um, so uh, once, you, once you get that ACG under control, you can use any kind of uh, hardware you want to. But I like this right here. This is what got, got me flying quickly and effectively. And it's cheap. It's really cheap. Um, uh, Software-defined radio, also known as SDR, uh, with a RTL dongle. Um, and, and people sometimes call, refer to this dongle here in the right they refer to that as the software defined radio, but it's not. Actually, it's just the basically a RF receiver. Um, 
it takes care of receiving the, the radio frequencies and converting them into ones and zeros for the uh, software, the actual software defined radio to then interpret and display and decode. Um, these things are cheap. They can, they can run you as cheap as $20. Um, and I've never really seen the need to, to buy more than a $30 dongle, to be honest with you. Um, but they do have them as high as $300 if you want to splurge. Um, and you can see sometimes even with that $20, it comes with a little antenna, right? Um, uh, the free software defined radios that I've used in the past are uh, SDR Sharp and HDSDR. Um, and they're free. You just look them up on the internet. In fact, you don't have to look them up. I'm giving you the links. Um, right there is your list of your software defined radios. Um, very, it's, it's not exhaustive, but it's extensive. Um, and this down here is your list of dongles the hardware that you can buy. And there's gotta be like 50 of these things. <laughs> so um, you'll have plenty of choice. And any questions? Okay. Uh, what, what, so what makes the SDR so powerful? Uh, well, it gives you a visual and this visual, it, there's a lot of information here. Um, so the, the, the ham radio operators here get probably get this already, uh, but I'll explain it anyway. Uh, what you have here is frequency, and you can see down here is these are the frequencies in megahertz. Uh, and then what you have here is the decibel, the dBm level of the various signals of those frequencies. So we know here that at 198 megahertz, we have a, let me, let me look at that carefully here, about a uh, minus 90 dBm signal. Um, and here, to, just to the left of it, we have another signal that's uh, about 100. Um, and what makes this so cool is the fact that you can see that, that right here, 198 is a man-made broadcast. That's a carrier signal from somewhere or somebody. And um, this, this part right here is, is what they call the waterfall. And it gives you the... Uh, the amplitude over time. So what you learn from this is back down here, uh, 20 seconds ago, this signal was not as strong as it is now. As you can tell, it's much brighter and larger here than it is down here. Uh, and then this uh, is showing you that, well, you know what, this signal is just dead on. He's just, he's just staying at the same amplitude. And this one here, if, I don't know if you can see that or not, but that, it's kind of faint, but, that's a faint signal. And so now you know that if you want to listen to, I don't know, sun, solar, you know, radio bursts, uh, uh, you can pick one of these frequencies because there's nothing riding on it. Um, but you got to monitor it for a while because, you know, as, a, as the ham operators will tell you, sometimes they're on the air, sometimes they're not. <laughs> um, but if you, if you know it, you're clear, then you go for it. Um, and this is just a graph to kind of show what I was talking about before. Um, any questions about what you're seeing here? We're, we're going to get more into this in just a second. That um, uh, line that at 198 that you showed before where you had sort of a width to it, is that actually showing modulation of the signal or is that just some kind of variation in the amplitude? Um, uh, you mean what uh, down yeah, here? That left the, to right, the left to right with oh, the, that. Yeah, the left to right is showing amplitude. Okay. Amplitude versus frequency. So, right, you know that here, well, let me go up one. Here you're at uh, neg 90 and you're at 198 megahertz. Okay. And uh, so here's another example, right in the middle of the FM band. Um, pretty busy, really busy. I have you know. a question. Uh, can, yes, can yes ma'am. Back to the, um, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure what's showing the sound versus, like oh. the little lines are showing that there's sound there and then the, um, the 198 just shows the range where you're hearing the sound. Okay, okay, so, um, at this point, uh, we're really just looking at the radio frequency, not the audio frequency. 
So it's not about hearing sounds at this point, but looking for what, what uh, we call a carrier frequency. Um, at 100, because you, you can't hear 198 megahertz. Um, not even your dog can. Um, and, and so that's what this is showing you is what's being broadcast across the spectrum of frequencies. The, does that help? Yes. Okay, because, because when you have a software defined radio, you'll have a tuner and it'll be like, it'll, it'll be a line right here and you'll be able to move that. You'll grab it with your mouse and you'll move it. And when you park it right over this, then you'll be able to listen to whatever, whatever is on that carrier. Now is 198 just at that moment or that's usually where you hear it and you never hear something at 197.5 or? Right, see, and that's, that's, that's the power behind the, the SDR is it, it gives you the visual to let you know that, you know what, there is something broadcasting at 198, 24 by seven. I have to stay away from that frequency if I'm gonna use something in this area of frequencies. Uh, I'm trying to illustrate that this is a good way to, to rule out frequencies to use when um, you're when you're thinking of starting a project to maybe listen to uh, meteors or or uh, uh, solar bursts. I see. So you want to go to like 200 because it's calmer. Yeah, it's calmer. It's quiet. Okay. I got you. Could, you. Yeah, you could even go to 198.5, and that's the power of the of the SDR. That if you were using hardware, <laughs> good good luck, right? You're kind of scrolling through the dial, hoping to find a dead spot. So, uh, and, and here we are with the FM. Um, if you were gonna try and camp out to listen to a nice uh, uh, natural radio frequency, you would have to go in between these lines here because as you can see, these are, are pretty tall peaks and they're pretty bright here on the waterfall. Um, what this is telling you is that there's a very f uh, weak uh, signal coming in and you'd wanna get in between those two if you're gonna listen to the natural uh, natural uh, 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 radio noise. Um, so next, antennas. Now, antennas are technical. This is going to be the part where you know you're going to have to just stay awake because <laughs> it's a little bit boring. But it is important to know the 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 purpose of the antenna is to help amplify a range of frequencies. Again, I'm probably oversimplifying that, you know, radio buffs would say, all right, that's probably not true on all levels, but it's for our discussion, it's perfect. Uh, your antenna is what's going to help you grab that signal, and make it loud enough for your receiver to hear it. Um, there are many types of antennas. Um, uh, you have a vertical antenna here. Think, you know, spiral or whip. You see those on, on the back of cars and and on top of your portable radios and things like that. Uh, you have a dipole antenna that's up here. Uh, uh, think rabbit ears. Rabbit ears are simply a foldable dipole. Um, Yagai, yeah, you see these on the uh, light posts around here. Um, I guess the traffic guys are using them for uh, signals. Parabolic which is right here. And of course, that's what everybody thinks of when it comes to radio astronomy. Oh, I've got to get a, you know, a 10 meter dish and put it in my backyard or in, no, you don't need that. Uh, you, you, can, you can do radio astronomy with a dipole or even a, a vertical whip if, you know, you position it correctly uh, or a Yagai or even this right here, which is called a, uh, a magnetic loop antenna. And that's one that I have in my basement. Um, the, the important thing to remember from all this antenna stuff is that uh, if you have an FM receiver, for example, uh, you want to use an antenna that's going to work with those frequencies. Uh, you, you don't want to get out your uh, satellite dish and try to plug it into your FM receiver because your satellite dish is picking up things in the microwave range. And my, microwave is just not going to work well with an FM receiver. Um, and also, to make it a little more complicated, you have to use uh, uh, an, uh, your antenna works best with the wavelength of the frequency you want to grab. So um, I'm going to cover that in more detail with the appendix. Um, but 
Another thing to remember is antennas are directional. If you, if you notice the, the vertical antenna, uh, this says radiation. Of course, we're not radiating anything. Um, we're, we're trying to receive, but the way it radiates is the same way it receives. So um, th this antenna receives things horizontally, right? So, so radio waves that are hugging the, the earth are gonna, are, you're gonna be able to pick those up fine with the, with the vertical. Um, but radio waves that are coming in from, you know, outer space, this is not going to work well unless you rotate it 90 degrees. Um, dipole is just the opposite. It picks up in, uh, signals vertically. So um, it's perfect for uh, a certain range of frequencies when you're trying to pick up things coming in from, from the sky. Um, you have your Yagai, which is directional, and your parabolic, which are directional. So you point those to whatever radio uh, source you want to monitor. Uh, any questions? This is probably the least interesting of it. But you will need it if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna get involved. You're you're gonna you're gonna need to understand antennas at least on a basic level. Um, uh, the recorder. So next is the recorder. This is probably the part you, you're going to be totally new to. Uh, the recorder, it, it performs the same job as a, as a camera does in optical astronomy. Um, it, it records the data or the noise level uh, from your receiver. And in the olden days, it used to be, they used to be strip charts. I don't know if you uh, were lucky enough to ever see them in the movies, um, but think of like a seismograph with, with an arm that has a pen on it. And when the earthquake comes, boy, that pen just starts swinging back and forth and making uh, these big long S's on the, on the page or jagged little mountains or whatever. Um, we don't have those anymore. We, we have something that's software-based. Um, and the software-based program that I use is called Radio Skypipe. Um, and we're going to be talking about that in just a second. To the right, that's uh, uh, Carl Jansky, uh, who I consider to be the, the founding father of radio astronomy. Uh, and this is uh, his strip chart. <laughs> Look at that monster. <laughs> it's a pretty big, bulky thing. And it spit everything out on, on paper, printed it all out for him. Um, but he, that's 1931. It's amazing he did as much as he did with the primitive level of technology that he had. Um, so here's radio, uh, oops, radio sky pipe. And it uses uh, the, the output from, or excuse me, the input from your microphone and it graphs the level of the input. So if you had radio sky pipe on your PC and you plugged in a microphone and just started blowing into it, you would see something like this, right? You would see the, the, the noise level go up to a point and then come back down when you ran out of breath. Um, pretty simple, but very effective. The part I like about this, there's a free version. Uh, and that free version is fully functional and there is no trial time. So you get the, the free version and you're in business. Um, it's very good. You can see here, I, I purchased the Pro Edition, um, you know, licensed to Kevin Lloyd, uh, uh, but you don't need to. <clears throat> uh, so continued here, it, it, it just does an amazing amount of stuff for free. Uh, you can, for example, the part I like and I think is cool is you can monitor the real-time data from observatories over the internet. Uh, this is what... Uh, this is how it looks in Radio Skypipe. And what you would do is you would go to mode and you would click it to client. And then you would uh, pick whichever observatory you wanted to pick up on. Uh, this one here is in Germany. Uh, it's a high school in Germany. And there's the frequency. And it's Radio Jove. Radio Jove is a project uh, that NASA started to get uh, amateurs like us involved in listening to the radio noise from Jupiter. Um, so yeah, you could just click on that and boom, you could watch what's going on in Kreuzberg, Germany. That I think is really the coolest part. 
But as you can read here, uh, it'll work for standalone mode or um, you can chat with other people while you're you know, doing observations. Uh, and it works for just about anything, Seism seismology, weather, anything, anything that you can uh, uh, plug into your sound card. So are there any questions about uh, the recorder? Uh, I'm sure there's gotta be some because this is uh, probably totally new to you. So the, those dongles that you described earlier, um, do they have an output that can then plug into the microphone jack that you can then use this SkyPipe program to record from? Okay, perfect question. In fact, that's the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe I should just go there, right? Um, here's an example of an SDR setup. Um, so uh, uh, what you have is you have uh, your dongle and that plugs into the back of your PC. Um, and on this PC, you're, you're, um, you've got your software defined radio running, right? And so the dongle then is attached to an antenna. So the radio frequency comes into the dongle. You're uh, tuning it with your uh, software defined radio and the output comes out of the sound card. Make sense? Yeah. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, it does. And then I guess that, that output you can then connect up through software to radio sky pipe and then record it. Yeah, this right here, what, what I do, this is actually, this is how I do it, um, because I never have um, powerful enough PCs to just loop the two, right, the sound output to the sound input. So what I do is I take the, the sound card output from my radio, which is just hissing, you know, like you heard before, and I plug it into the microphone input of this guy, which is running radio sky pipe. So... And then I use a KVM switch to switch between the two computers. Right. Cool. Yeah. And that's how, that's how it rolls. Works great. Um, I saved a lot of money by using old computers, by the way. I mean, this radio sky pipe will run on a uh, uh, XP or windows seven. Any questions? You answered mine. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Does it work for uh, the Raspberry Pi, you think? Uh, it'll work with all kinds of stuff. Uh, actually, I have used for this, I've, uh, no, for this component here, <clears throat> I used uh, one of those little mini X uh, Android boxes that sit on top of your uh, TV and help you surf the net from your TV. I found an Android based uh, software defined radio, loaded it on there. It worked great. And it fit right in my hand, the whole, you know, the dongle and the, and the uh, mini X fit right in my hand. Good point. Good question. Because basically if it, if it had, if, if, if it's a computer that has a windows operating system or an Android operating system, you can use it. At, at least you can use it for the software defined radio part. I'm not sure about radio sky pipe. Good question. How do you how do you know what you're listening to? Like you say, oh, I'm listening to Jupiter. How do you how do you know that? Um, <laughs> you know what? These are great questions because I think that's the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, you guys have been reading my mind. You guys are good. All right, so um, so tips and pointers. Um, uh, 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 RFI is down here. I knew I should have put RFI first. I, I, I debated whether I should put the RFI first or second. Um, but uh, uh, RFI, radio frequency interference, um, is, is a joke I have about uh, what do you call a radio astronomer? Well, he's a RFI investigator um, because you spend a lot of time running around trying to figure out, okay, was that really Jupiter or was that, uh, uh, you know, my daughter baking cookies in the oven? Um, 
because at 20 megahertz, you will pick up a lot of radio interference um, from things. Uh, I, I also like HMS. Was it a ham radio, a microwave, or a stove? <laughs> and uh, so you just have to watch and be observant of what's going on around you. Uh, when you see those spikes coming up and you think, oh, is that a Jupiter radio storm? Well, I don't know. Is somebody got the stove on? Because I've seen the stove do that. But good question. Th does that help you understand? Did, did I answer your question? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, yeah. Uh, Kevin, um, is there like a, a chart or a listing to tell you, you know, what frequencies to go after for a particular objects? Um, I don't know that there's a chart, um, but a Google search will reveal it pretty quickly. Um, once you start looking at the sun, uh, you'll see that there's type one, type two, type three, type four radio bursts, and it'll give you uh, typical frequencies of those bursts. Um, but you know what? I don't want you guys getting pigeonholed on that because uh, of the fact that, that I've observed the sun uh, using an AM radio. Uh, I, I use my, you know, my, my SDR, like I showed you before, I found a blank spot in the, uh, in the AM band, and I was able to pick up radio bursts that low. So um, explore. And you know it's a radio burst from the sun because it said that there was a flare or something. Exactly. Thank you. That that that's a great point, guys. Um, and I'm not. I wasn't really prepared with the slides and everything, but NASA has a space weather um, web page where they track all of that because you know they have trillions of dollars worth of satellites orbiting the sun and the earth monitoring the the space weather out there and uh yeah so I, I, when i saw the the burst on my radio telescope i immediately went there and said okay what, what was the sun doing anything at that time and yes it was and and so then i compared the time that uh the burst the 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 solar flare happened and i timed it with my uh chart and said yep there's a correlation there that's what it was that is a great site as i have i use it all the time uh, to uh, figure out what frequencies i might want to uh, operate on mm -hmm. uh, but it gives you an awful lot more information yep because that ionosphere gets blasted when uh, when that happens and you might not be able to use higher frequencies so Totally. In fact, that's what I'm doing now. I'm doing, um, that's my, my latest project is uh, uh, SIDS, Sudden Ionospheric di uh, Disruption, I think it's called. And uh, that's what you described when, when the solar flare hits the, hits the magnetosphere. Yeah, we lose, we get, we get radio frequency blackouts. Um, so, so there, you know, there's the RFI, but this is a part um, that I want to go back to this that, that's really important. Um, if you have this too high, if you have this output from your software defined radio too, too loud um, for your microphone, it's going to mess you up and it's going to mess you up in a, in, a, in a deceptive way. What's going to happen is, is you're going you're gonna to be going along and this, is, this level here is going to be at a certain height and you're never going to see it vary. And you can think, what's going on? What, why, you know? Um, and that's because you're simply overdriving the input of your, of your microphone. So there's some tuning that has to take place here between these two. You don't want any, either of these at maximum. Your sound card, you have to work fiddle with it a little bit. You're going to have to fiddle with the output level here in your software defined radio. And you're going to have to fiddle with your uh, sound card here as well. Um, to make sure you don't get deceived. And the way I do this, the way I tune it, is uh, I, I pick up a, <clears throat> a frequency in the range. Um, well, actually, I don't have to pick up any frequency at all. It can just be the noise. Um, and, I, and, and I watch the, the chart here and I say, okay, it's right here at this level. And then I come over here and I just disconnect the antenna. And when I disconnect the antenna, you should watch all these spikes go away 
and then you should watch this drop. And that should tell you that you've done it right. Because if you, if you pluck the antenna off of this guy and he drops and then this guy doesn't do anything, uh-oh, uh-oh, there's a problem between the sound card output of this PC and the sound card input of this PC. I don't know if that makes sense or not, um, but uh, uh, once you start getting involved and fiddling with it, you're going you're gonna to catch that real quick. You're going to realize, uh, you know what, I'm not really listening to anything. Right back to the previous question. How do I know I'm, I'm hearing Jupiter? Well, um, first, you got to make sure your gear is actually responding. Um, and that's not easy sometimes. But that's what this paragraph is, right? If, you're, if your output is too high the microphone, uh, for the microphone input, the level gets distorted and then any changes in noise amplitude are gonna be missed. So be watchful of that when you set up your first uh, radio telescope. Any other questions about this? This is really the, the heart of the, the, the matter. Make sure we cover that. Kevin, how much directional control do you have over the signals you're listening to? I mean, can you can you aim at like uh, the general direction of say Jupiter or a meteor shower radiant so that you kind of cut out other signals and just focus in a particular area? Yeah, and that and that's a good question because um, you can aim a dipole a couple of different ways. Um, I don't know how to aim a spiral. And of course, a Yagai or a parabolic, they're naturally directional. So yeah, there are ways to do this electronically, physically. Um, it, it really depends on which frequency you're, you're monitoring. And uh, actually what we're gonna do is we're gonna, I'm, I'm gonna show you some of the antennas here in, in a second. And, and I think that'll answer some of your questions. Um, um, you can only really listen to the sun during the day and Jupiter when it's up. It's not like you can listen to Jupiter, you know, when it's on the other side of the world or anything. That's correct. Not effectively. Uh, the radio waves will uh, get deflected by things like the ionosphere uh, at night, but, or I mean, during the day, but, you know, then you have the sun blazing down on you with all its radio energy and that's disruptive at 20, you know, so that's a good point. Excellent point. Monitor the sun during the day and monitor Jupiter at night when it's above the horizon. Good point. A um, little deeper than I wanted to go, but know that, it, please. Uh, so, so here's, oops, I keep doing that. Decamet decametric radio noise from Jupiter. That's the technical term. Basically, uh, 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 it's radio noise that's in the high frequency band. Decametric refers to those wavelengths I was telling you about. Um, and what you want to research is the Radio Jove project. Um, radio emissions from the sun are broadband. So they're everything. I'm just up into the hundreds of megahertz uh, uh, or like I said, down in the hundreds of kilohertz. Um, wide range of, of study that can be done there. And, and, and honestly, there's just work to be done here in these areas. If you wanted to get serious and monitor the sun, there, there's just a lot of work that needs to be done, scientifically speaking. Um, counting meteors um, and how that works is the, the meteors produce a, a, a ion trail and um, that ion trail will, will reflect the carrier frequency of a distant station. So uh, a station that you can't hear because of the fact that those radio waves due to the curvature of the earth are actually going over your head because they're going in a straight line. Um, will we'll then hit that ionized trail from the meteor and then get bounced into your receiver and you'll hear it go ping. Um, and I was having trouble finding that sound on the, on, on the internet, but it's out there and you can listen to it. Um, so you can set up a receiver and you can count all the meteors in a meteor shower, or at least most of them. Uh, again, there's a lot of a lot of people have done this already on the internet, uh, and there's entire web pages devoted to it. 
same with the, the sun and the same with Jupiter. So those three are very easy projects to, to get involved with. Um, are they, uh, that, meteors, what, what frequencies will they be? Uh, okay, what do you think the meteor shower? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that would be, you, you'd have to find a, a, a radio station that's over the horizon and you'd get out your SDR and, and you'd look at it and you'd say, very weak signal, very weak signal. He's a good candidate. And then you'd probably want one from the north, the south, the east, and the west, all points of the right of, of the compass. And then that way, whichever way the meteor is coming in over you, you're gonna get a you're gonna get a ping. That's good. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So, um, good question. Uh, the next two cataloging the frequencies emanating from the center of the galaxy. This one's a challenging one. Uh, save that for when you've gotten. Uh, a lot of experience with the uh, antennas because, you know, it was discovered at 20.5 megahertz, but I, I don't know how high up it goes. Does it go up into the, um, into the microwave range? I, I don't know. Gigahertz? I don't know. Uh, but it would be very interesting for me. And that, that's one of my projects that I'm going to work on uh, when I'm done with my SIDS project. Um, the next thing is, uh, is uh, coordinated optical observations of Jupiter uh, with the uh, uh, Jupiter radio noise. Um, that would be another big project. How did they uh, recently, they detected x-rays from you know, Uranus? You know oh, did? I did not hear that, that, that they had done that, but I'm not surprised. Yeah. You, you know, Kevin, you, you mentioned in our prior conversation on this last bullet point about the optical and radio observation yes. of Jupiter, but you could pretty much do the same thing with a meteor shower with like a an all sky camera, just mm -hmm. pointing straight up with the uh, the radio antenna monitoring at that same point to capture the audio from it coming in as well. Exactly. There's all kinds of interesting things we can do, um, which is part of the reason I want to give the, you know, this presentation. I, I want to, I want people to get excited about it and, you know, start getting out there and, and uh, doing stuff. I've made huge, I mean, huge discoveries, which are discoveries for me. Somebody else had already discovered them, but I had said, you know, I think that, there's microwave energy coming from that thunderhead over there. So I, I would take my uh, microwave radiometer, right? Which is a microwave radio telescope. And I pointed it at the thunderhead over there on the horizon. And sure enough, I got microwaves coming out of it. And I said, yeah, that, yeah, I was told, I've discovered something. And I went online and I found out in the sixties, some other guy in Boulder, he had done the same thing and wrote up a scientific paper. <laughs> But I still went through the process of developing a hypothesis and a theory and then, you know, went out and did a test and proved it true. So um, kind of the fun of it all. So here's the appendix. Um, uh, so Jim, how much time do I have? No, keep going. Keep okay. Going. Okay. So, so early beginnings, this is, this is the story of Carl Jansky. Um, and when you get to the sl slide deck, you're going to want to hit this and, and uh, uh, read, read his story. Very interesting. Uh, like I said, I'd love to tell it. Uh, I'd tell it again, but uh, we're kind of short on time. So, uh, but what I want to point out here is um, this right here. That's Carl Jansky's dipole antenna. And, and the reason I, I'm bringing this up is because when it comes to antennas and radio telescopes, you can be as creative as you want to. Uh, notice that notice the wheels here. He has this thing on a on a turntable, and he would turn it every which way, and right, he's trying to find that white noise and where where is it coming from, and so he would turn it, and sure enough, that's where he found it coming from the the galaxy center. Um, so there you go, go go make one of those in your backyard and see if your wife divorces you. Um, where, where is that antenna? I don't know. I don't know. It looks like it's out east, though. Flat and with lots of tall trees and green. <laughs> you come out west here and everything's rocky and there's hardly any green and trees aren't very tall. 
Um, good question. So here's a radio block diagram. You know, if you're if you're going to get into it, this in in red is what I, I you know, the software defined piece. You know, the dongle takes care of the RF frequency. The software defined radio part takes care of this intermediate frequency range and, and demodulation, and the PC takes care of the sound card. That something that few in the future you'll probably want to re re reference, but right now it's probably. Um, here's my antenna slide from before. I included it just for context. Um, but this is what I wanted to show you about the wavelength and how uh, a wavelength, uh, it's sinusoidal and uh, one wave is starts at zero here, goes to a positive peak, crosses zero again, goes down to a negative peak, comes back up to zero and that's considered one full wavelength. Um, the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. So they're inversely proportional. Um, this right here is a dipole antenna. It's a, uh, and it's showing you the, the effect of um, when you have magnetic energy, a magnetic wave crossing a wire, uh, current and voltage are generated across it. And that's how we generate electricity. Uh, what we do though, is we have a static magnetic field and we run wire, you know, wires through that magnetic field very quickly and that generates our electricity. Um, so it's just the opposite of, of how we generate electricity. And that's why the, the length of this dipole is so important. Um, you want to capture the whole wave if you can. Uh, and, and just to give you an example, 100 megahertz, the wavelength is 9.5 feet. So, um, you know, that, that's not too bad. But if you get down into the uh, like 5, 10 kilohertz in AM, you're, you're looking at a, a, a wavelength of 1900 feet, close to 2000 feet. <laughs> Try and get a dipole antenna that's 2000 feet, all right? Maybe in Antarctica, you could do that, but not here. Um, but there's good news. Um, the good news is that uh, the hammers already know this, but uh, uh, antennas work just fine for half length, quarter length, and one eighth length of the wavelength, the frequency you're after. So you can um, uh, uh, get away with, uh, if we go with our FM, you know, station here at 100 megahertz, right? You can get away with 9.5 feet or you can do 4.7, 2.4, 1.2, all of which I'm just cutting the number in half or even 7.25 inches. And if you if you notice when you have a, a portable radio, it has the telescoping antenna, you'll notice it's about 18 inches, no matter how big the radio. And that's because you can actually tune to that frequency by collapsing that antenna. So. Right, if it's 18 inches and you say, man, I want to listen to my 100 megahertz station, but it's coming in really weak and staticky, you can then go and, and, and collapse that antenna down to 7.5, 7.25 inches, and it'll increase the, uh, your reception on that 100 megahertz um, because you'll be tuning your antenna to that frequency. Um, uh, and then remember that, that, that all these wires, they can be coiled up too. This is a, a magnetic loop antenna that's in my basement. Uh, you can see my natural gas pipeline right there. <laughs> um, and uh, it has 400 or 540 feet of laminated copper wire. And I built that myself. Okay, this stuff is easy and it's cheap. And I find it very, re very rewarding too. Um, and down here for resources, I'm giving you a wavelength calculator click on this, it'll take you on the internet and you can plug in the frequency. It'll tell you how long the wavelength is. And then you can just start using some division and cut it down to, you know, size. I think this is a 164th, if I remember it. It's a 164th size antenna. Works pretty good. And then here's some basic antenna theory that which you wanna go to sleep at night just read that. <laughs> um, oh, any any questions about that? I kind of went through it quickly. Uh, just a couple quick ones. So, how many different antennas do you use in your projects? Okay, so I've got one, two, three, four. I've got four. Yeah, I've got four. 
are they all for like different frequencies? Is that why you've got them for the most yes. part? Yes, okay. yes, and 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 that's a great point because um, like the dipole antenna becomes less effective at a certain frequency range, right? So uh, a dipole antenna um, is for I'm just I'm just going to throw a number out there. I'm probably not right, but you know, 10 megahertz is probably less efficient than it is for, or I'm sorry, 100 megahertz. Uh, it's less efficient for that than it is for like 20 megahertz, right? right. So, so as you start, and, and that's why when I was talking about that one project of, of cataloging the different, um, yeah, cataloging the different uh, frequencies emanating from the center of the galaxy, it's going to be a challenge because I'm going to have to come up with five or six different antennas, uh, okay. right? capture as I start getting into different frequency ranges higher and higher. So um, yeah, yeah, this is the technical part and um, it's good to read up on it so that you make sure you have an, an antenna that's gonna catch those frequencies in a, in a effective manner. So I have, Thank a, you. Um, I have a, a weird question about this. Um, so can you sample this because the 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 waveform is complex right so you can you run it through like uh, a fourier transform and pull out sort of fundamental frequencies that there's are all kinds of things you can do with this stuff i mean if like that's a very advanced question right um but yes you can i'm wondering if if you're looking at something or an area and will it have a signature like will it have certain frequencies that are coming from that objects that are you maybe not unique, but sort of can be a signature for that object. And if you go to another object, the frequencies that you can pull out of the signal would be different. You know, well, yeah, you think know. about it. You know, you have hot gases and, and the primary element of the one cloud is, is hydrogen. It might emanate a different frequency range than one that might be helium based. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, that's cool. You can really take this as deep as you want to and you can be as creative as you want to, because look at this. Um, this is just a, a antenna here that somebody made. I'm not even sure if that's a, a you know, an outdoor oh, uh, fire pit or something, right? <laughs> but he puts an LNB, which is a low noise. Um, oh gosh, I can't remember my acronyms anymore, but it's a microwave receiver. And he puts a stand on it, right? And he puts it out on his patio. And when that radio source goes across his, uh, the, the field of his antenna, boom, he gets, a, he gets a hit. He gets some readings. Pretty simple, right? I mean, this part might cost you some money, the, the LNB. But uh, who knows? You might have got that from a used radio supply store. I don't know. You can go as low on the economic scale as you want to, or as high. Um, uh, here's one that might answer a, a previous uh, um, antenna question. So right here is your antenna, this circle, right? And I'm sure that's mathematical in, in its design, how big it is. But notice the wire mesh here, the chicken wire. That chicken wire is a reflector right? So it enables this, this antenna to be pointed in a direction. And when it's in pointed, when, I mean, when it's pointed in that direction, then you get the maximum amount of gain because the, the signals are coming through and they're hitting the, the copper, but they're also going back here and they're hitting the reflector and they're bouncing back and then they're hitting it again. And that's where you get your, uh, your, not only your directional aspect of it, but it, 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 it helps the gain, which is another thing I didn't talk about with antennas, but your ham radio guys, they'll, they'll explain all that to you. Um, here's another and the, one. And the, the, the chicken wire on that, I guess, because the wavelength is so long, that's essentially a solid to the radio wave. So it exactly. acts like a solid as it reflects everything back. Yep. And, okay. and, and, and to your point, uh, a microwave would go right through it. Right. Yes. Um, 
You could use just sheet metal too, whatever. Good point. There's somebody who knows his antennas and frequencies, right? So, so here's another one. Notice that you have a wire, uh, uh, just a, a straight uh, uh, antenna there, um, maybe 18 inches or two feet. But look at this contraption. Again, it's a reflector, right? And he's trying to boost the, uh, the gain here by uh, just having this big scoop catch all the radio waves and bounce them into the antenna. Don't put that in my backyard. My wife will flip out. <laughs> That's ugly. Um, uh, but here's another example. Uh, here's a guy from SETI. Don't laugh. <clears throat> but um, he's, he's done the same thing. If you, this big contraption here is nothing but a reflector. The antenna is this thing that's right here in the middle, kind of hard to see. It looks like a two element Yagai or something. Um, but what he's doing is, is the frequencies come in here, they reflect and they bounce onto his antenna. So it's a big scoop for radio frequencies. And he, you can see he can, he can move it, aim it. Um, the bottom line is when it comes to antennas, you can be as creative as you want to, so long as you play by the rules of, of wavelength. Um, and you can make a great big monstrosity like this guy, or you can be something smaller, you can buy it, you can build it, whatever you want. And I think that's it. I think that's the entire presentation. So any last questions? Do you want me to review any slides or? How, how um, do, you, do you have any problems with the um, satellites with this? Or do you actually track the satellites? So that's a good question, right? Because I haven't done a lot of work uh, uh, with the center of the galaxy, right? Which is where I would think the satellites would come in play. Uh, but I think if, if I was aimed right at a spot in the sky where a satellite crossed over, I would probably see a dip in my, um, right, in, in, my, in my reading. So, so that line would, would go straight and then it would dip a little bit and then it would go back. And that's because the satellite would simply be blocking the radio frequencies from that area. Um, that would be a guess. Uh, it's entirely possible that the uh, satellite is so small in relation to the massive, huge radio source that the radio waves would simply go around it and it wouldn't impact my readings at all. And what, what kind of safety precautions do you take with uh, a setup like this? Okay, so safety precautions, you got to make sure you don't trip over these wires and stuff. Uh, and that's about it. Is there no, everything... like, gr special grounding or anything involved? Uh... So, so, so there's a good point in, in, in that um, you have a, you know, if you have a 40 foot dipole antenna in your backyard, um, when the thunderstorm comes, you know, <laughs> it could strike that dipole antenna and follow that lead right into your house. So um, I don't have any external antennas at this point. Um, I, I refuse to based on that very fear, right? It, it can not only wipe out all your radio stuff, uh, but it can do damage to your house and to you personally. So, um, but if you were, uh, there are, uh, you know, POTS, the old plain old telephone service, they used to have uh, devices that would short to ground when lightning strikes came, got on the, got on the wire. So you could use something like that. Uh, but no, I, I don't have a lot of experience in that area, but I'm sure that the ham radio operators on this call do, and I'm okay. sure they've, they can answer that very well, much better than me. Okay. What additional point? I'm sorry, what was that? I'd like to make one quick point. You're talking about wires and stuff. 
mm -hmm. with these uh, dongles, you have a very small connector for a very small piece of cable that mm -hmm. uh, screw into them. And those connectors are very susceptible to damage. They are easily damaged. So uh, once you get it set up, you want to have it so that it's away from being able to be tripped on or uh, moved around uh, just to protect the cable. Thank you. Good point. Sounds like you've done that before. Yeah, I've made all the mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, anybody else have any questions? You can re-enable your video fees if you want. I have one question about the, um, the SDRs and the dongles that you talked about. Do they normally cover only a limited frequency range or are those pretty broad? So one will cover pretty much everything you want to study. Yeah. So, so that was one reason why I wanted to point that out was they go from on average, they go from around 25 megahertz up into the, uh, into the gigahertz range. So that covers a lot of ground, but not all dongles are equal. So you have to go and do your research and, and figure out what frequency you want to, you know, be listening to and then go down the, the road of, well, let's see. No, I can't use that one. I can use this one. The one that I showed in my slide, I like that one. I have that one because there's a, a setting that you can enable in the uh, software defined radio and it'll go and it'll uh, uh, it'll change the frequency range on it so that then you can go all the way down to like uh, 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 AM. Okay. You can go down to the, like the hundreds, hundreds of, of thousands of, of kilohertz yeah. or hundreds yeah. of thousands of Hertz. And that's low. That's pretty low. Yeah. I also have an RTL SDR. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're great to play with. Right. Yeah. I was, I was using it for HF with uh, a TSA-30 to uh, get a readout, you know, a display readout to look where open frequencies are. You take the IF output of the radio, plug mm -hmm. it into the SDR, and it'll do it that way. Okay, yeah, yeah. you're already there. Yeah, if you want to be a little more sophisticated, uh, I use what's called a, an RSP-1A, uh, Again, from DC to daylight, um, you know, very, you know, down your low bands all the way up into the, into two or three gigahertz. Uh, oh, yep. Very easy to set up. Uh, works with several different types of the uh, SDR uh, programs, uh, and very, very easy, very intu intuitive. And what I do like about this, though, is as they add features, I can download that and get additional features into the awesome. radio. That's awesome. Yep. Hey, Carlton, can you can you post the model number in the chat that for that radio? Yeah, sure. Thank you. It's uh, it's about one hundred and twenty dollars, or that's what I paid for it a couple of years ago. Which is pretty. That's that's about right for something. I've looked yeah, at the, those. Yeah, the original one, which was an RSP one, came out at ninety nine. Um, I borrowed one to play with, uh, liked what I was liked what I saw. Went out to a big ham convention. Uh, they had this thing. This was the newest and greatest. So, uh, you know, you had to come home with it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Use using heterodyne, right? I mean, super heterodyne. That's an awesome way to do it. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Okay. So got I, I I got a question. Sarah, are you in the radio? Um, rock and roll radio. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> you you were asking some some good questions there, so I was I was curious if you were doing radio stuff. No, it was a good talk. I was interesting. Cool. Very good. Yep. Simple, really. I mean, you can get off the ground for. If you have a couple of uh, computers lying around, you can get off the ground for, for 30 bucks. Very, very nice. Uh, uh, Ro, are you back with us? Yeah, kind of. I'm on my phone. I don't know what's going on with my laptop. Okay. Uh, we, I, I think we lost Robert uh, Chamberlain. 
Um, I could email him real quick because I know he wanted to show live pictures of oh, where yeah. he is. Okay. Let me see if I could email him. Okay. All right. Um, All right. Well, while uh, Roe is doing that, um, does anybody else have any uh, questions or comments for Kevin? I want to welcome you all the way from Colorado. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, you. I grew up in Maryland, so I understand humidity and <laughs> stuff like that. Great presentation. Thank you Great very presentation. much. Presentation. Loved it. Oh, yeah, it was my excellent. pleasure. My, excellent my, presentation. Yeah. Thank you. My, my pleasure. And, and for, for disclosure, this is actually Kevin's first presentation on the subject. Yeah. You did good. Excellent. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Uh, I'll be uh, I'll be talking to two other groups that uh, I'm loosely associated with, and I'll you know give them your information, Kevin. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think they'll they'll enjoy it as well. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, while while we are, are, are waiting to see if we can get uh, Robert back, um, there. There looks like we may have some upcoming presentations in uh, the county parks that I'm working with. Uh, it, it started um, with me talking to Cloverdale, but it's it's also uh, now Caddis Island and uh, Jake's Branch. So right now I'm set to do three different uh, presentations right now in the fall on three different subjects. Uh, one of them will be um, light pollution. Uh, another one will be uh, nature and astronomy with binoculars. And the third one is either going to be, um, you know, basic astronomy with uh, telescopes or, or uh, DSLR Milky Way, which I have to do some exploration. Uh, I'll be going into the Caddis Island and uh, Cloverdale in the dead of night with the uh, the parks people, just to try to get some preliminary uh, photos and uh, deal with the uh, light pollutions and see if uh, we can make anything happen from it. I could tell you right now, Caddis Island has those motion lights. Oh, they're gonna. They already told me they're gonna shut it off. They'll be shutting the lights off that night. <clears throat> Uh, just a minute. I have to. There you go. You're an echo in there. <laughs> I had to shut off the phone and reassign to you. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. Robert's not answering me, so I guess we lost him. Okay. He was using his phone, and they only had 3G out there. Right. So it's possible that he, you know, just wasn't strong enough. Well, we can maybe the next meeting we have, we can have him as a uh, an introductory uh, follow up. You know, to well, this. he was going to do live shots. He was. Yeah. Oh, live shots. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. He was there. If you noticed, the dishes were behind him. Right. Right. Okay. Where is he? He's in New Mexico. <laughs> oh yeah. At the VLA, whatever that oh, is. Oh wow! Really? Wow. Lord's array. Yeah, very large array. So that's that's where he wanted to show actual pictures, but I'm not able. I'm I'm refreshing my email. I'm not getting them. Okay. All right. Um, got a um question for uh, Sam. Uh, Sam, uh, any uh, yeah possibility of uh, doing another virtual? Um, for the club. I'm in between exams right now, so I should be fine uh, any Friday or Saturday night until maybe um, maybe May 6th, around there. After May 6th? Well, before May 6th. Oh, from before now to May 6th. Uh, okay. Well, you, you let us know when you're comfortable, you know, okay. being that it's test time. So, okay, well, like I said, any Friday or Saturday night from now until then. Okay. Um, now, now that the weather's getting nicer, it would be great to get out, especially with a lot of us having our shots. Unfortunately, there's nowhere to go. Right. We could all go to Sam's backyard. He's got a big yard. 
Yeah. Nice of you to uh, offer, Sam does. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not bashful. I'm just going to say it. I mean, there. I think there's a little more light pollution here than compared to Tom's River. So, oh no, no, it's it's only getting it's only getting worse. It's getting worse and worse. <laughs> yeah, they just okayed a four story hotel, you know, on 166. <laughs> so it's getting worse. Mm. Well, uh, even LBI. I mean, that new hotel they put up down there, plus whatever else they were building on the strip. I mean, LED light heaven, you know. Yeah, I, and, and I was, this weekend, I was toying with the idea of uh, going to Vonnegut Lighthouse until I saw the weather report. Well, I had planned on it, too, to do something because it's um, the new moon weekend. Last right. night, the sky was impeccable, but I had to work in the morning, so I couldn't stay out. Right, right, yeah, same, same here. But, yeah, but um, I mean, for some of the new people, you know, it'd be great to get them out under the stars. You know, I'm at the point where shot or no shot, I don't care anymore. <laughs> right, and um, I, I ran across a photographer in uh, the Brick Photo Center. And she's asking me to do a paid workshop for Milky Way photography. So oh. I, I I don't know. <laughs> Think you're up for that? I well, that's why I'm saying I don't know. <laughs> oh come on, hey. I, I'd have to see. You know, maybe when my other camera comes back, because right now uh, <laughs> Hap Griffin is modding it for me. Yeah, so I'll be joining the ranks of Sam getting my camera modded. I like your buddy, Ro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised she wasn't here sooner. <laughs> yep. Stop. Stop. Yeah. Uh, Jim, which, which camera do you say you're modding? Uh, I'm doing the uh, the Rebel T6S. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not going to do the new one, the D80. I'm going to keep no. that. Yeah, for... I, yeah, I figured. Yeah, I'm keeping that for work purposes. Yeah, the, the only the only camera that I'd modify are like, like or at least try to modify myself are like less expensive ones. Right. Yeah, I, I figured I'd I'd go with the older one with the less bells and whistles. Yeah. You know, keep the other one, uh, you know, up to par. Although I think they do have the D90 right now. Has anyone done any visual observing at all on their own? I know Ron does his photographs, um, but I'm talking about actually standing at your telescope looking in the eyepiece. <laughs> right. Anybody? Nobody? How many years ago are we talking? <laughs> What's that? How many years ago? Yeah, right. Uh, well, see, that's the perfect, that's the perfect reason to get into radio astronomy that Kevin was showing us because you don't have to worry about all that, you know? No, nothing like standing there at the eyepiece, cold, <laughs> hot, whatever. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like interested in all aspects of it. You know, some of the things that Kevin talked about, especially with the Jupiter project of the doing uh, observational as well as a radio at the same time, you know, I have the all sky camera coming in and it kind of like piqued my interest of trying to capture meteors going by with that ping as the visual is actually happening. That does yeah. sound cool. What was that, uh, Sarah? That sounds like fun. It's, It'd be funny to be watching them and hearing the pinging. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you it's know, a good way to... Go ahead, Kevin. It's a, it's a good way to verify that it's working, too. I, I've experimented with it in the past, and I, oh, there was a meteor shower, but I didn't hear any pings. I'm not really sure it was working. You would have the perfect way to know if it right. was working. Yeah, see, I usually know when a meteor goes by is when I hear, like, row off. Vic, row you know, like, oh, look at so. that. And I had my cat, my head in the camera. I missed the whole thing. Row always is looking up. Daytime, <laughs> nighttime. <laughs> Although Vic is, Vic is with me when we're out together, Vic always sees them too. Yeah. 
Hey, Jim, I have a question. Um, I'm Liz Schultz and I'm new to the club, but um, I'm primarily a photographer and I've started getting interested in Milky Way photography, but you said you're having a camera modified. What kind of modification are you getting done? They're, they're taking some of the uh, internal filters out. Okay, in, like it, an infra, a full right. spectrum. So what it does is it allows the camera to collect more light to come in. Yeah. And the ability to like get the, the I'm going to say my Brooklyn way, I may mangle it, the nebulosity, say okay. like of the Orion Nebula, you'll see more of that. Yeah, because uh, I've been looking at having my old, my old DSLR converted to infrared and uh -huh. full spectrum is one of the options. And they say that's the best for astrophotography. So that, that's probably the way I'll go then if I have it, that converted. As I understand it, if you're really looking for the camera to be like dual use, full spectrum. Um, but uh, ha ha Hat Griffin actually talked me out of doing that. And uh, I'm, I'm getting a, a different set of modifications. I can't remember it off the top of my head. But uh, yeah, I don't see anything wrong with full spectrum, you know, from everything that I've read. Yeah, um, I'm pretty much going to dedicate this camera to just astrophotography at this point, so okay. I, I don't really have to worry about it. But right. if if we do get cleared out from this lockdown, or after I get my last shot on April, you know, seventeenth, you know, if there's time to go out somewhere to to do a Milky Way stuff, you know, we can probably set something out and set something up and do it. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. You know, it's not that hard, you know, before the, uh, I'll be nice and I'll say the, the, the tourists come in uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, you could go to Barnegat Lighthouse before all the lights start lighting up in the, uh, you know, all the huts over there. Right, right. No, not um, the balls. No. I went a couple of years ago, my husband and I were out in Yosemite. Mm -hmm. And it was my first attempt at night sky photography. And I didn't get the galactic center, but I've got a picture of El Capitan with right. a lot of the, you can see all the stars and even the Andromeda Nebula, which is really just a fuzzy little ball in the picture. But um, that really piqued my interest. Right, right. Um, I'm, I, I like to do Milky Way. I also like the idea of a wide field astrophotography is so it's not just like the one object i'd like to get like several of the objects in that particular area right and um you, you know i i like i like the bigger picture yeah so the object may be smaller but i get you know i'll get more of them in there right. yeah. and you know for that i've got you know the 14 millimeter lens i got the 135 millimeter lens mm -hmm. and um, I just picked up a 300 millimeter lens <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and uh, at a really good James, price. James, have you done a lot of star trails? Who, me? Yeah. No, I, I, I refuse to do star trails. I, I just don't like the way star trails look. I, I'd rather actually get the shot or do a time lapse. You know, time lapse is my my preferred over uh, star trails. Okay. Um, now, Liz, uh, uh, one of the best locations for, I, I think, your kind of photos that you would be going to would be a place called Cherry Springs State Park. Um, my brother-in-law has been there. He's yeah. told us about that. We haven't had a chance to go out there yet. Um, right. Yeah. I, another location that I've been to is the Adirondacks, which uh, I do have one of my time lapses for the Adirondacks uh, also uh, on our club um, YouTube page. Okay. And um, I will be going back out there in October for an astrophotography workshop. Okay. And right. uh, one of the goals for me and my wife will be going out there a day early before that is for us to hike up what's called uh, Mount Coney. It's a mile hike where we'll get to the top and actually get Milky Way pictures from that, you know, that mountain range. Oh, nice. You know, mm -hmm. so, so far I've dropped 35 pounds just in prep for it. Oh. 
Okay, I, I have one more question too, because my husband's more interested in, in photography of things like Jupiter and its moons. And we're looking to get a starter telescope. And um, do you have on your webpage or anything, any recommendations? Um, we saw one at the photo center, a Mead star navigator that had the, the little computer that you would plug in the object I guess you have to align it first and then plug in the object and it'll find it in the sky for you. I, I, didn't, you, I, I didn't see that. I got like words going up behind me. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I, I didn't see that one there the other day. It's like Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, I never let this video go, go that long. Um, <laughs> The uh, I didn't see that one there from my reading and both Ron and Sam can correct me on this. I think the CST type telescopes are better for planetary. Okay. I don't uh, think the star navigator is all that. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Right. I would and, stay away from it. And, and, okay. if you, and if you are looking at a telescope at the photo center, stay away from the Mead light um, light switch as okay. well as that Celestron there because both their motor drives are not working. Okay. Yeah, th those are scopes that are in need of repair. You might also want to check that uh, telescope you get can carry the weight. If you're going to put a camera on it, yeah, I'm sure it can carry the weight of the camera. You probably can Google some information on some models you're interested in. Liz, okay. as a member, you're eligible to borrow one of our telescopes. Okay, if you go great. on our website, we have a whole list of telescopes that you would be able to borrow. Some of them okay. are go-to telescopes. Okay. So if you're interested, you know, see which one you might be interested in and then, you know, contact John. Okay. Yeah, that's the best way to that's the best way to go. Um, you, know, you're, you as a club member have the option of borrowing different type of telescopes to you know really you know figure out you know which one you may be interested in. Okay, I could put in a comment myself. Uh, Phil Zollner talking. Um, I've done a lot of planetary work myself in years gone by, and I've learned that they're very small targets, as you know, mm -hmm. Especially, and even close up close up lunar photography. So focal length is a primary consideration. Um, and that's why I, much of the planetary work I've done over the years was done with, a, with an F-15 Max Sudoff telescope. It had a 3000 millimeter focal length, but you need a lot of focal length when dealing with these very tiny, tiny subjects. Um, and I've learned that <laughs> from experience. Okay. So uh, stay away from anything with a short focal length. Okay. Also, thank for you. Also, the planets are very, like Phil said, they're very small, and you don't want to use a DSLR for the most part because you're only going to get like a dot, like a star. It's better if you were to get like a CCD camera, maybe like a, a one from ZWO. And they're not, they're, you, you need a computer to use it, but at least it'll, pick up more information or get a bigger picture. It's like, okay. you know, that's the other way to get around the focal length is you get one of these to, to pick up on the, on the camera, like a ASI 120 MC or MM or a, or a ASI 224, you'll be able to see at least a, a bigger image, you know, than just, a, you know, the, the DSLR, you're not going to see much because okay. it's really small. All right. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Uh, and, and for further reference, um, Stan uh, posted in chat a uh, web page, planetary-astronomy.com. Yeah, this, okay. um, I don't know if you can see this. I just got this book on planetary astronomy. It's a really good book. Um, we came from Europe, some amateurs, but it's uh, an excellent book. And you can see it on that website there. I just bought this. Great. Thanks, Dan. And there's also another website that you can look at that'll, that uh, will give you a field of view calculator. You type in whatever you want to look at, all right? 
you type in your telescope and the camera you use, and I'll give you a representation of what you can see. It's called astronomy.tools.com, I believe, and it's uh, one of the, you want to look at field of view. Okay, great, we, we, thanks. We, we do have that listed on our webpage. Okay. The astronomy tools, and it was um, part of our uh, discussion from last week, yeah. uh, last month, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Got a question for Kevin. Okay. Um, I would like to be able to use part of your presentation to a radio local radio club. If that's okay. Sure. Uh, all right. Great. Thank you. Yeah. It's not copyrighted. <laughs> with the with the solar maximum. Um, sort of coming our way. This is exciting times for you, year and up, right? Yeah, I I hope the solar the solar activity has been so quiet these last twenty years that yeah, man, well, I'm really last, disappointed. The last solar cycle really was terrible. So for like like the last ten years, when I joined, I joined when I became an amateur in eighty eight. That was a real good peak. Right. So, you know, it was worldwide communications any time of the day. But the last couple have been really bad. And they're saying that this one is going to be as bad as the last one. So, yeah. and, and bad means fewer sunspots, fewer flares, fewer right, everything. Right, right, by the way, right. for the people hey, not initiated. Maybe it's because I won that solar telescope. That's why it's so dry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can look at a blank disc. <laughs> I, I, I bought one just in the beginning of COVID and a few months later, I won a, a solar telescope. So, so now I got two of them. <laughs> yeah, that reminds me, Neat is uh, tomorrow. Maybe you can win another one. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I'll go in for another raffle, see what I can win. Okay. Um, any, anybody ha else have anything uh, for us tonight? All right. Okay. Well, um, on that note, then I guess um, we'll uh, you know close up the the meeting for our our April uh, club meeting, and hopefully uh, I'll get this uh, published. Um, you know, once I get all my elements for the uh, astral projections online, um, Kevin, I'll give you a copy uh, of it as well. You know. You know, being that the article is going to be based on your presentation. So, everybody, thanks for joining. And uh, thanks, Kevin. Have thanks. a good evening. Oh, thanks, Kevin. Thank great you, guys. Thank Kevin. you, Kevin. It was a great Thank you. Presentation. Us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to fly. <laughs> no, I'm on Zoom. Next month. There you go. Next month. Okay. Right on. <laughs> okay. Good night. Night. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye.